Listen, Jesus Christ was no stranger to offense. I mean, Herod was offended at his very birth and wanted to kill him. Imagine being born into a very scenario in which your entire existence is a scandal. You are the God-man. I mean, let's just look for a second at the scandal of offense that followed Jesus throughout his earthly ministry. In Nazareth, people wanted to throw him off a cliff. Jesus healed someone on the Sabbath. People wanted to kill him. He healed a lame man. They wanted to kill him. People wanted to kill him because he claimed to be the Christ. He claimed equality with God, so they wanted to kill him. He was making himself to be God, so they wanted to kill him. Many people were believing in him, so they wanted to kill him. I could give you Bible verses for every single one of these, but we don't have time. It is an understatement to say that Jesus himself is the rock of offense, a stumbling stone the builders rejected. He stands as an affront to any system built by human hands. He stands in very opposition to any Tower of Babel of our own religious constructs to reach heaven on our own. He is pure sacrilege to the religious systems that we hold sacred. He invalidates every self-help, self-improvement ministry aimed at climbing the holy hill to God. This scandal of the gospel has for ages caused great men and women of God to be vomited out from the religious systems of their day. There comes a point in the lives of many great saints where the rock of offense begins to manifest in your life in such a way that you essentially are forced to start working off the grid. You know, Paul would roll into town hoping to work within the framework of the local synagogue, but more often than not, they would run him out of town on a rail. He was lucky if he didn't get stoned or beaten half to death. Then he would move out of the safety of the so-called local believing community and begin carrying the message out into the highways and the byways, onto the streets, bringing the message to the Gentiles. And in all honesty, if Paul had not been rejected by the Jews, who knows if his ministry to the Gentiles would have ever flourished and developed into what it became. I mean, sometimes it's the curveballs thrown to us by the religious detractors that actually force us out of the boat to begin pioneering outside of the four walls. I mean, in my own life, as many of you know, I was a rather popular conference speaker before I believed the gospel. I remember a time when everything on my calendar was a speaking event of 1,000 plus people and then overnight blacklisted and vomited right out of the big shot charismatic conference circuit. But unless I had been forced to work off the grid, I never would have had the unction or freedom to really pioneer the message of grace that we now carry. I've always been local church. It's not like I've ever intentionally pulled away. I, I mean, only by getting outside of that system though, by force, <laughs> did I have the flexibility to really really speak truth and deliver something that otherwise could not have been birthed or at minimum my message would have just been water under the bridge and quickly forgotten about by the time the next conference speaker at the circuit stood up for his session and preached everybody back into the law. People get insurmountably nervous when you begin to rock the boat of lifeless traditionalism that has become their safety net and the little box in which they believe God resides. And people can spout until they're blue in the face that God does not live in a box, but these self-same people will still demand your blood the moment you suggest that their out-of-the-box God was just neatly filed away into a different shaped box of their own making. Stubborn and stiff-necked, any movement of God must align with their existing protocol. There's no paradigm for the truly inexplicable or the mystery of God's ineffability that is not only just beyond us and foreign to our tradition, but moreover, it may invalidate the mindless ritualism and self-effort in which we are entrenched and highly invested. You see, a common theme here 
with many great revivalists is this whole deal of working outside of the grid. John Wesley, George Whitfield, and the First Great Awakening, they left the pulpit to begin preaching in the streets. Now, on the one hand, this was because the church buildings couldn't hold crowds of 5, 10, 20, 40,000 people gathering to hear them. But a more inconvenient truth that the history books often gloss over is that these men took to the streets for the most part precisely because they got kicked out of the churches. Now, I am not comparing myself with Whitfield and Wesley, but one slight comparison that I do see in terms of working outside of the grid of the existing system is that I never once made it my intention to work outside of the institutional church. I've noticed over the years, I mean, since I host a lot of my own events in schools, that many folks assume that I bailed out on the local church or the conference circuit, and that in my hard-headed stubbornness decided that I was just not going to play with those guys anymore. Some say, John, you should start doing conferences with the big boys again because they need this message. As if I intentionally walked away from it all. No, I got canned. It's humorous to me. I mean, there are many pastors who actually do want me in their churches, but they don't even bother requesting me because they assume that I only work solo. The Lone Ranger with his occasional sidekick Tonto, Tim Wright, doing music or something. Again, again look, please, I'm not trying to personalize this. I'm not having a therapeutic vent by sharing a bit of my testimony. This is not even about me, okay? The most atrocious thing to me is when people get a spirit of rejection and they just assume that everybody is out to get them. See, I've found that this is all a blessing in disguise. So I am not bitter. I am not brooding or insecure or taking that whole victim thing on board. I mean, I've seen enough of my friends just fall off of the whole wagon because of this, this kind of deal. Look, I'm, I expect favor. And I know that when it comes to the common man who doesn't have a bone in the religion business at stake, then there are far more for me than are against me. No, this week, the reason I'm bringing this thing up, I want you to realize this for your own life. Because once you get a certain bit of negative feedback, our natural inclination at times is to start second guessing and wondering if all the Pharisees are right. But I am also not saying that every bit of resistance we get is defined as persecution. If you reach a point where you are always right and everyone else is always wrong, that is a sad state of arrogance to arrive at. I mean, I've stirred up a ton of trouble that was rightly merited. Sometimes we just do dumb things that cause unnecessary trouble. So don't get a persecution complex and arrogantly think that every bit of negative criticism is always wrong. Let's stay humble. And that's not what I'm talking about. See, when I'm talking about the rock of offense, I'm not talking about a spirit of rejection. And I'm also not talking about this constant, continual deconstruction that guys get into on Facebook and Twitter where all they do is tear down, tear down, tear down, and then suck their thumb thinking they're the only right ones and they're misunderstood and everybody else is deceived. No, I am talking about the joy and exuberance and radical, scandalous liberty of grace, undiluted, that stirs up the ire of the zealous Sanhedrin, which lacks a true, deep knowledge of righteousness by Christ. Christ alone. And I am not just talking about offending for the sake of offense. I mean, Jesus has some pretty harsh words to say about that kind of stuff. For the one who causes the innocent to stumble, I think he said something about millstones tied to their necks and being dumped overboard, but we're not going to go down that road today. I mean offending the mind to reveal the heart. I mean confounding folks only to open their eyes to revelation. I mean shocking people into a realization of God's goodness. I mean not really trying to do jack squat. I mean, you're not actually doing anything to offend people. Religious people will get upset for the very fact that you're not doing all the stuff they expected you to do before. It is the rest of faith itself that is radically challenging to everybody prone to help God out with their little efforts, okay? So let's always remember to bear with the weaker brother, the older brother who has been slaving away for an approval that he's always had. No, love is the rhythm of this whole thing. We have to love folks, man. Just who the folks who don't get it, Paul says to bear with them, but he also doesn't pull any punches 
on what he believes. Okay, the scriptures vehemently poke fun at human pride and pretension. Jesus always used humor and irony all the time in this way, constantly employing satire to mock the overly serious Pharisees. He used humorous images like the blind leading the blind, swallowing a camel, anal retentively cleaning the outside of the cup while leaving the inside filthy, having a log rammed in your eye while trying to pick the speck out of somebody else's, whitewashing the beautiful tombs that are inwardly full of dead men's bones, and let's not forget loudly honoring the former prophets while plotting to kill the present ones preaching the same message. I mean, man, Jesus is truly a guy who was offensive and who worked off the grid, yet his message was the most universal and all-inclusive and loving of anything ever to touch down on planet Earth. And Jesus was not the only one who employed this kind of sarcasm, this offensive language. I mean, think of Elijah mocking the priest of Baal as they begged and slashed themselves in a frenzy. Shout louder! Maybe he's busy. Maybe Baal's taking a dump. Why, why hasn't he showed up? Or what about Martin Luther? Every Protestant calls him a superhero, but if they actually read his books, he's like the prophet, again, who's venerated after he dies. His books are laced with horrendously obscene insults. Please enjoy, I have uh, written here a few um, of the following Martin Luther insults. Here a few uh, Martin Luther quotes that you don't often heard repeated in Lutheran churches. You are the prostitute of heretics. Snot nose. You are a bungling magpie croaking loudly. You are admirable, fine, pious sows and asses. You are like mouse dropping in the pepper. You are like a brothel keeper and the devil's daughter in hell. You cowardly slave, you corrupt sycophant with your sickening advice. You are idiots and swine. I can with good conscience consider you a fart ass and an enemy of God. There you go, Martin Luther. Use those carefully. <laughs> and talk about working outside of the grid. Man, Luther had the whole of the Roman church coming down on him, trying to kill him. But he just happened to be born in a day with this little thing called the printing press coming into fashion, and they could not stop him or stamp out his words from the bully pulpit. It went to the masses. The Lord has always made a platform for his message. This is why you never have to be afraid of getting kicked out of the grid if you've got something that is vitally from the Lord to release. I mean, millions came to faith in the televangelism of the 1980s before all that stuff went south. I mean, those guys were working outside the grid of the institutional church in their day. Now, granted, TV ministry is pretty institutionalized today, but before Jim Baker started picking up hookers, I mean, it was cutting edge and highly effective in reaching society. And maybe I'll never be on TBN, but thank God for YouTube and the internet. The internet is a crazy, fresh, off-the-grid platform for the gospel today. And I'm not saying that every blogger out there is, is Martin Luther nailing his Wittenberg theses to the door, okay? But any more than, than any book that's hit the printing press was ever inspired, or every Christian TV telethon. But we are living living in exciting times when voices of reform have this crazy worldwide platform to spread the good news of the gospel like never before throughout the web. And at the end of the day, God is going to get the word out. And if we can reform the system within, that is beautiful. But sometimes it is in his very sovereignty that he allows us to be shunned or excommunicated just to reach a broader base. I mean, look at all the mystics of the church, all of the saints who were brought before inquisitions. It is the sick, not the healthy, who need a doctor. So allow the Lord to send you uh, beyond just preaching to the choir at times. And and. Look, nevertheless, whether within or without, the gospel just doesn't come without offense, okay? And hey, before we go, we, I want you to come get offended right out of your religion with us, okay? I'm about to go on tour with Tim Wright. I'm going to be in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, Chicago, Nashville, Tennessee, and up New England and Massachusetts, okay? Not to mention, I'm going to be in Cheesehead Country. I'll be in Wisconsin for our only mystical school for the whole year in America, okay? So these and lots of other fun events coming in our announcements. Check them out. God bless. My only mystical school on the entire calendar for the United States will be in Wisconsin, Manitowoc County, September 9th through 11th. 
I'll be in Seattle, Washington for two days for a Supernatural Grace Seminar, our only Northwest event. Register online, thenewmystics.com slash WA. The long-anticipated East Coast leg of our Gospel Mania Tour is finally here. The West Coast blew up earlier this year, but now I'm bringing Tim Wright to four more cities on the East Coast. Pepperell, Massachusetts, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, Nashville, Tennessee, and Chicago, Illinois. Last chance to lock in a spot for October, thenewmystics.com slash tour. I'll be in Geneva, Switzerland for our only European schools this year. Then I am back to the UK in January for a mystical school in Manchester, England. Find all our events at thenewmystics.com slash schools. It's also not too early to lock in a spot for our India mission trip in 2017. We're already open for applications, so visit thenewmystics.com slash India. If you've considered diving into theological study but don't have the patience to filter through lifeless dogma and dead intellectualism, Cana New Wine Seminary has gathered a dream team of non-religious, grace-based instructors who have a deep grasp on the finished work of the cross. Dr. C. Baxter Kruger, Francois de Toy, Dr. Eric Wilding, Matt Spinks, Tony Sai, Rod Williams, myself, John Crowder, and more. This is a school that is experiential, supernatural, and saturated with the tangible presence of God, a drunken seminary. Seminary. Maybe you can't afford the time and resources for full-time study. Well, that's why we put Cana online. Study at your own pace, wherever you live, with only one session per week to learn at your leisure, at a fraction of the cost of the on-site course. This is a two-year seminary with both years comprised of two semesters each. Early bird registration is now open at a discounted rate until October 14th at Cana.co. Sons of Thunder runs on partnerships and generous contributions from people like you. If you've been blessed by the ministry and want to participate in sharing the gospel and reaching the poor with us, consider becoming a monthly supporter at thenewmystics.com partners.